Okay, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech, and we're talking about community matters this morning. We're talking about what happened to the 21 containers that fell off the young the young brothers' barge uh, a week ago. Uh, very important that we discuss what happened because this affects shipping and therefore the supply line to Hawaii, which is very important in the time of COVID. Uh, we had a ferry once, and we lost the ferry. There's a lot of reasons for that, but uh, Young Brothers knows what they are. And um, you know, the problem is that now we only have Young Brothers among the islands. This is a, an interesting opportunity for us to look at it. Uh, we have uh, Jay Friedheim. He's an admiralty lawyer here in uh, Hawaii. Um, practicing since 1922. And we have James Mercanti in New York City, likewise an admiralty lawyer. Uh, so we're going to talk about the uh, Young Brothers incident. Let's, let's start with you, Jay. Uh, what happened? What happened on Young Brothers Barge that 21 containers dropped off? Well, <clears throat> at Tuesday at about 4.30 a.m., the Ho'o Maka Ho, which is the barge, was being tugged from Honolulu to Hilo. And then somewhere close to Hilo, about 21 of the containers, their 40 foot long containers fell off the back end and nobody noticed. So there were, there's some questions exactly what it is. I'm only getting my information out of the newspaper ads, or newspaper articles, excuse me. And it appears that this, there might've been, they might've been stacked five high on the stern, which is an extraordinary kind of configuration for it. And there were some descriptions that uh, uh, the uh, state senator um, Kai uh, in on the Big Island said that he learned that some of the lower containers appear to have been crushed. So there's some there's some failure maybe in the way that it was lashed. Lashing is how you tie these things together and and get the uh, you know get it stowed. Uh, Young Brothers has their own people doing the work of loading and unloading them, and uh, so. You know, there's, um, I don't know the exact details of how and why, but basically 21 containers went overboard and then 12 of them went missing for a while. And there's dangers there for navigation. Somebody could run into one of these things. They could go to the bottom. They could destroy marine life. Uh, some of the containers apparently had cleaning supplies in them. And I don't know what else is in them, but then it becomes a big question about, well, if you own the stuff inside of one of the containers, how do you get a recovery? And that goes to things like the bill of lading. When you go to ship, uh, you fill out this information about how much uh, the stuff weighs and how big it is, and you declare value. The standard in the industry is $500 per package limitation, but Young Brothers graciously gives you $5,000 per package limitation. But the value of these things can far exceed $5,000. I mean, what, the amount of stuff you can get into a 40-foot container is amazing. And in some of these situations where they're packed with brand new cars or big screen TVs or other things that are very uh, vulnerable to uh, salt water, the, the losses can be astounding. But if you don't buy extra insurance, which they sell you at about 13 cents per $100, so if you don't put up a few hundred dollars as insurance, you're limited to this 5,000 bucks and that's all you're gonna get. Mm. Anybody investigating this? Uh, I would imagine the Coast Guard is investigating it, especially in view of the contaminants you described. Um, and who else, anybody else investigating it? The uh, National N NTS, 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 National NTS. Transportation Safety Board, yeah, they would be doing it too. You know, I think James Mercanti might have more experience with them. I'm not really- clear. Okay, let's turn to James. James Mercanti, an Aberty lawyer in New York City. Um, you know, just a, a cursory view of Google on this, you find that containers slip off uh, container ships all the time. Uh, so where does this fit in the, in the landscape of um, containers slipping off container ships? Well, as you, as you said, Jay, uh, and Jay, Jay Friedheim, that was a good summary. Uh, this is not unusual, uh, but it's you know it's very it's very dangerous. Uh, recently, containers slipped off a ship in off the coast of Australia uh, twice this year. A ship off off Western Australia have lost containers overboard. It happens in the North Atlantic in rough weather all the time, and the, the problem is the danger because these containers uh, they have buoyancy, and they start they they tend to float right below the surface of the, of the ocean and they create a tremendous hazard to navigation. 
uh, not only to commercial shipping, but uh, yachting and sail, sailboats. And uh, so there's a potential liability exposure uh, to the ocean carrier here, which is uh, you know, Young Brothers, for further liability if you know a jet skier or a parasailer or another commercial vessel runs into one of these containers in daylight or at night because they tend to creep and float right below the surface of, of, of the sea. And um, uh, they be, it becomes a very, uh, you know, a, a potential ex additional exposure to the carrier. Now, mm. how, how these claims usually work, uh, Jay and Jay, is the, ship, the shippers of the cargo, so the, the, the people that have the cargo inside the containers, they have cargo insurance. And all they're gonna do is that they're gonna place a claim into their insurance carrier. It's like if you have a fire in your home, you place a, 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 a claim into your homeowner's insurance. And then they're gonna get, uh, they're gonna get full value for their goods. So it, it becomes when the, the, the insurance company, the term is called subrogation, so when the insurance companies and so let's just say, as Jay Friedheim said, there's a shipment of, of, of uh, Samsung TVs and uh, I'm the shipper and that costs me, those TVs cost me a million dollars. I have an insurance policy and I'm going to recover that million dollars from my insurance carrier. And then my insurance company is then going to go after uh, by subrogation the ocean carrier to get their money back. And that's when these limitations of liability uh, come into effect. Like, uh, you know, Jay said five, uh, $500 per package or $5,000 per package. The big question here, Jay and Jay, is what the package is, right? The, 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 the package limitation, each, each TV could be a package. Each car could be a package. The big question is going to be whether the container is the package, because you could have fifteen million dollars worth of cargo in a container, and if if I don't know what uh, uh, Young Brothers Bill of Lading says, but if they attempt to describe the container, this forty-foot container as a package, that will be challenged in the courts because packages are usually aren't usually the full container. Yeah. Mm. Oh, very interesting. So um, do they have the right to describe what a container is or a package is, or is that something left to the Public Utilities Commission uh, or the state government in general, in this case, because it's inter-island, uh, to decide, to define, to make a rule in some way, uh, saying what a container and what a package is? Well, that, that, that's the key question, Jay. Uh, they, there is a contract of carriage right, and I think Jay Friedheim's holding it up, <clears throat> the contract of carriage here is called the Bill of Lading. And the Bill of Lading has those terms. There's probably many, many pages of fine print that you need a magnifying glass to read. And in those Bills of Lading, ocean carriers do try to limit their liability by defining uh, a container as a package. But there's certain cargo cargo liability schemes that apply, you know, federal statutes like the Carriage of Goods by Sea Act, uh, the Harder Act, and it depends which act they incorporate. And some of those acts, Jay, allow you, uh, allow the carrier the freedom to define what the package is, and some don't. So those are usually a big part of a lawsuit. So when the, when the, so when the marine insurance company takes it, 10 or $15 million subrogation claim and sues the ocean carrier, you know, here, Young Brothers, in federal court, Young Brothers is going to say, well, wait a minute, you know, I'm only responsible for $5,000. And that becomes a big part of the, the lawsuit as to whether that will be contractually allowed or statutory allowed as a matter of ad admiralty law. It's a high stakes game. If I just say hypothetically that a container and the 21 of them was filled with televisions. Uh, televisions are, um, you know, a high value item. And so I could put, gee whiz, I could, you know, the idea is to put as much as you can into the container, right? 
Um, so I have hundreds of them in there. Now, if uh, the 5,000 on the whole container applies, that's $5,000, that's not a lot of money. But if I have hundreds of televisions times $5,000, that's millions, it's millions. Um, and so th this is a big thing. And I guess the question also, uh, to, to get this out of the way, is the liability for the $5,000 absolute, it's a, it's a kind of bailment where you know the, uh, the carrier is absolutely liable for the 5,000 or is there a question of negligence there? Well, that well, comes up in the claims process. The first thing that somebody who's lost goods on one of these things has to do is called notification. You know, they got to let the company know, hey, I had this material and there's a time limitation to get that notification in. So a false alarm is easier to deal with than a late notice. If you're late notice, you're past like the statute of limitations. So the second step is information gathering. They, you start to work with a claims person and they say, hey, what did you have in that container? And they want original receipts. They want to see exactly what you got. Otherwise, they're going to do fair market guesses about what a thing is worth. And then the last part is called determination. And that's when they're going to sit around and they're going to say, you know, is the claim, is it a covered claim? Is this something that the insurance company has to pay on? And then how much is the policyholder eventually going to be entitled to? Now that process gets turned over through subrogation and insurance to highly trained professionals like Mr. Mercanti in New York. And his people go in there and they survey the material and they figure out and they try to negotiate a deal that, you know, spreads the costs out. There, this is just falling off containers. There's, there's ideas in maritime law, flotsam and jetsam. You know, flotsam is when the boat goes down and things float up. And if those things float onto the shore, maybe they belong to uh, the, the government or the state. It used to be the king got to claim it. Jetsam, that's when they say, uh-oh, we're going down. Let's start throwing containers overboard. And that leads to ideas like general average and specific average in which some cargo is sacrificed to save the rest of the cargo. So there are these issues about there, you know, whether it's flotsam, jetsam, or longan, which is when the thing goes down and is at the bottom, or a derelict. That's when something's gone down to the bottom and nobody thinks they can get it. Remember Howard Hughes went and got that Russian submarine, pretended he was going out there and picking up uh, magnesium nodules, but they were really picking up this huge vessel and it was a very big undertaking. To what, what this company has done is they hired um, a, a salvor who's gone out there with a 250 foot crane on top of a vessel to try to get these things up and out of the water. So it's a big deal. So let me go back to James now. I wanna ask, is there absolute liability or is there a question of negligence? Because Jay was talking about lashing <clears throat> Maybe it was improperly lashed and properly stowed. Uh, so if we find negligence, does that enter into the liability of the carrier uh, for the $5,000 payment? Uh, or is it absolute? It's, it's an another good question, Jay. It's not, it's not absolute. Uh, what, what I think that um, uh, uh, the, the carrier will do here is that is they'll tender the, if, it, if it's $5,000 per container, I think what they'll do is, is tender that amount and not worry about fighting about their negligence or not. But to answer your specific question, it's, it's not absolute. Uh, the $5,000 or the $500, which is under the carriage of goods by Sea Act, it's a $500 per package. And there's always disputes of what the package is uh, but you're allowed to increase that unilaterally. So apparently, uh, young brothers here have called it $5,000, maybe out of the goodness of their heart, uh, maybe for uh, good commercial business relations. So it's, it's not absolute liability. There still has, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a limitation of their liability. It's a cap. It's a cap on their liability if it's sustained. But well, let me, let me go are, further than that. Let me say- There are defenses. They would have defenses that they may not have to pay anything. Right. Um, so, so, but we suppose we find this was grossly negligent and reckless. 
and uh, you know, in, in derogation of life and safety uh, on the voyage and to the crew and to other vessels and what have you. Um, so is, is there a possibility of getting more uh, than the tariff amount, the tariff limitation by a claim of say, I mean, I'm thinking non-maritime now, but say treble damages or punitive damages um, based on gross negligence. Jay? I think you're mixing apples and oranges here because one of the questions is who the person is who owns it initially, what is their rights and their claim? And that's like an apple. An orange is what if those things went overboard in a marine sanctuary like happened off of Monterey a few years ago and these containers went down into this marine sanctuary and the shipping company then is obligated for pollution damages to the government and they jump in wholeheartedly and they do everything they can to protect the environment because they're in for everything. They can well, uh, yeah, I'm not talking about that yet. We need to talk about that. I'm talking about the liability of the carrier uh, to the shipper who has lost the container worth of goods. Um, and Very my hard question to is- get out. It, it's, You're not liable for consequential damages. It's really the value of the goods in there. It's locked in. It has to do with contract law. What you're talking about is torts, you know, like an intentional act to harm people. You know, maybe you could get out of the out of it then. But that is really not. I, I don't think I've ever seen a situation in which. Uh, let me, uh, I could address that, uh, Jay. So, in these kind of situations. Uh, if, if the carrier is not entitled to limit their liability, remember these $5,000, they're just limitations of liability. But if that, if, if they, but they have the, especially under the Harder Act, if the Harder Act applies, which is when shipments are made between two U.S. Uh, uh, like, like here, between islands in the United States or between, you know, two United States ports, it's called the Harder Act. The carriage is governed by the Harder Act. It's a, it's, a, it's an 1893, you know, statute. Um, and, but carriers have a burden to prove, like here, that they properly equip the vessel. They, they use due diligence to properly man the vessel. So they may, if they had an incompetent crew, if they didn't have suitable equipment um, that, uh, and, and supplies, like the lashings, if they own the lashings and the lashings were, you know, broke, uh, then, then their limitations, their cap on liability is out. So then if you have your $15 million of TVs in a container, the insurance company that paid the $15 million to the shipper or the owner, they're going to be able to recover their $15 million. But if the carrier meets their burden of proof to say, hey, look, we did everything right. We had a proper crew. We had proper supplies. We had proper equipment and we just got hit with this storm out of nowhere and it's an act of God, which we don't know yet what their defense is, then they'd be able to cap, you know, there may be no liability or at least a cap on their liability. So let, let me talk one second about, it sounds to me like if this was a crushing type incident where containers were collapsing, you know, there's the first thing that the Coast Guard or the NTSB is going to look at is the stowage plan. Every carrier has to have a stowage plan. And it's, it's gonna be the shape, the shape of the barge and each container. So I, if I'm the captain of that tug and you give me the stowage plan, I can tell you what's in the starboard corner, tier number four, third row, and what's in that container. And I should be able to do that by the stowage plan. Can and you tell the weight, is the weight identified? Yeah, the, oh, weight yeah. is the weight is identified as well. And that's where it becomes interesting because if they put like the equivalent of, a, of an automobile on top of a deck of cards, that would be negligence on behalf of the carrier. And so, so, so for example, putting five containers high on the back of the deck, that may be a mistake. Maybe in the past, they've only done four containers, but because this, you know, because of COVID and the fact that the shipping has been slowed down, they may be backed up. Uh, they may have they may have had to make you know uh, put a lot more on 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 each uh, barge because of all the cargo that's been backed up. It could have been perishable cargo that's being perish perishable. So 
if they I, I think that's a really good point, James. One one which council ought to consider because this is the same company that is in the legislature saying they're not doing well because of COVID and the you know the failure of the local economy, and they they're need asking, twenty five million dollars for a bailout. Who so are the, I mean, if I were council involved, I would think that maybe they went slack on stowing these containers. And, and we need to know more about that. Right, well, we, the other thing, uh, one more, Jay, one second. One more footnote to that, Jay and Jay. The other thing is too, that'll have to be looked at, right, that the whole, the fact that they may have been, um, because of COVID, uh, stowing more cargo on, on the barges than they should take. That would be the lack of due diligence. That would, that would destroy their a limitation of liability. Uh, and also, you have to look at these, not only the lashings, you know, sometimes these lashings, they have to be maintained. They have to be oiled and greased. If the lashings weren't properly maintained and they and they broke, they're made out of, out of wires. The other thing is these containers. The containers have to be properly maintained. If these containers are 15 years old and they start, and they've been, they've been on, you know, uh, eight, 800 journeys, and they, and they, they, you know, they have corner posts. Each container has a corner post. So there's four corner posts and sometimes those collapse. So if you put a very heavy container on top of three light uh, cargo containers, those corner posts can just collapse. And if, if they're using improper containers, that'd be another failure to exercise due diligence on behalf of the carrier. Mm, I, I, I want to go to here. one other point, Shane, you touched on it. And that is, um, you know, the, the problem of uh, safety of life at sea, of the safety of other vessels. Um, and James talked about it too. Uh, and I want to know how that works. So suppose I have a container, it's just at the surface because it's, it's got air in it, it's floating, or it's just under the surface, can't be seen so easily. Maybe, uh, you know, other, other vessels are not looking for it and not equipped to look for it. Um, and it's a collision. Okay, and this is unmarked, obviously, on the chart. It was not the fault of the, the vessel that collided into the container. Let's assume that. What, what liability do we have? That's pretty serious, isn't it? Well, uh, that's what I was saying from the beginning. There's a lot more exposure here than meets the eye. I mean, the first thing that everyone's talking about is cargo and the loss of cargo. But as Jay Friedheim said, there, 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 there could be pollutants in the water and there could be sanctions against the carrier, uh, they're, they're, res they're responsible if there's any pollutant in the water. Uh, and also they'd be responsible if, as you said, a parasailer or a jet skier or a tour boat or another commercial cargo vessel runs into one of these containers, they're not gonna sue the cargo owner. You know, they're gonna go after Young Brothers. So look, that's why Young Brothers, obviously as Jay said, went out and spent a lot of money and hired a salvage crew with a big crane mm. because it's in, it's in their best interest to get these containers, find them and get them out of the water. And they're not doing that, Jay and Jay, just to recover the cargo because whatever cargo was in those containers, 99% of them, then first of all, containers are not watertight. So whatever cargo is in those containers is most likely destroyed. So the reason they're getting those containers is to protect their own interests from pollution risks and liability for collisions, as you just said. You know, and, and, the, we... and the notion we, Jay and I talked about this before, is that suppose Young Brothers and its 240 foot vessel cannot find a given container. Suppose it's lost at the bottom of the sea. Um, I don't know how deep this is. And somebody stumbles into it later. So in fact, somebody goes out there trying to make a buck. Somebody wants to use the law, the Admiralty law of salvage. And he has his own 240 foot vessel and he's trying to own, he's trying to get and own a container that's down the bottom uh, that Young Brothers couldn't find. He finds it, he wants it, he raises it. Is it his, does he own it? What about the law of salvage as it applies to these containers? Okay, well, there's okay. If it's just out there and it's free, it, it's it's one thing. And if somebody finds it and they help to improve the property mm. or save it, they may be entitled to all of it or some of it. But I think the bigger question is who is Young Brothers? 
And how did we get into this situation where they and Matson are the only people that are moving cargo in our island? Young Brothers is really a, a company in Washington state, a family owned company that owns lots of maritime businesses. And they have been in the business of making sure that Hawaii doesn't get to step up into the modern century. The rumor is that it was Young Brothers that sunk the inner island ferry. If we had that inner island ferry, you could fill your pickup truck or your, your van with goods or food or produce and get on the ferry and for a hundred bucks, bring it inner island and have yeah. your own vehicle over there. At the very last minute, after hundreds of millions of dollars were spent to create this inner island ferry, it was Young Brothers supposedly who shot them in the back and got rid of the ferry. And as a result of that, people who can do this kind of stuff don't want to do business in Hawaii. Young Brothers fought to get- Well, that's a, that's a tragedy, that story. And if, if you're game, I would like to have that discussion on another show. It's a tragedy to shipping and our economy. And certainly we feel it now um, because of what's been going on and what happened with Young Brothers. But let me go back to the salvage question. Yeah. So suppose somebody else lays a line on one of these containers and brings it up and, and takes it away. And Young Brothers says, no, 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 that's ours. And, you know, and our, our shippers, um, who wins that? What are the considerations? Well, Jay, you, you, you're asking great questions. You really are. Uh, the law of salvage is, is probably the oldest law in the land. There's been salvage uh, for, Since for Rome. centuries. Rome and, started it. You're right. The, it was, yeah. it the law, yeah. The laws of Oleron. <laughs> the laws of Oleron. So, but, so but Jay. That. In Rome itself. Right. Let me answer the question, though. <laughs> if, if, if someone were, you, you get what you call in admiralty law, there's the law of fines and there's finders keepers, right? And, and this goes back to finding treasure on a, on, a, on, a, on a treasure vessel where you find the cargo. Uh, there's, there's one called the, um, uh, I can't remember the name of the, sailing wooden sailing vessel that sunk off the coast of New Jersey with a cargo of gold bullions and it, at the, it was found 80 years later and it still turned out that the insurance companies who insured it were entitled to the major part of the value of that gold because at the time they had no way to uh, no, no technology to access the gold at that depth so the question is going to become here no one's abandoned the cargo. There's going to be a quick, a very important question of abandonment. Mm. Nobody's abandoned the cargo. Everybody's, yeah. everybody's looking for the cargo. So first of all, the only way you're going to get any type of award, and you can get a salvage award, if, as you said, a, another tugboat company puts a line on a container and brings it in, they'll probably get, quote unquote, rewarded. But the reward is based upon the value of the goods that they save. So okay. if, there, if there were a million dollars of Samsung TVs in that container that are now worth nothing, they didn't save anything. They may, they may get an award based upon the value of the container and a 40 foot container in, in these days, and they may be old containers, may be worth you know, $4,000. So to answer your question, if you want to be a salvor, and I imagine there's a lot of people out there that are looking for these containers. First of all, they haven't been abandoned. The insurance companies haven't abandoned the cargo. Young Brothers haven't abandoned the containers. But if they do rescue one, say Jay Friedheim rescues one, he'll be rewarded for the value of what he saved. And he may have a percentage of the value of what he saved, the percentage. And it may be a percentage of $4,000. So it probably is not going to be worth anyone's time to be out there and spending the, uh, expending the fuel cost in looking for these containers, other than out of the goodness of their heart to save further casualties. Mm. So th this would be determined by a federal judge sitting in Admiralty? Absolutely. Yes, Absolutely. or an arbitration, depending upon the agreement, if the salvage is reached in a way. Mm -hmm. It was the Marine Ordinance of Trani T-R-I-N-I, -I, that set a, it set a reward whether the 
whether the owner claimed the goods or not. So this is really ancient law and the Romans brought it in about whether or not it was abandoned. Abandonment is an intentional act. You have to say, I give it up, I abandon it. Otherwise, if, if you have- Well, that's certainly, on, that hasn't happened here for sure. If, if, you, if you hook a buoy onto something that's going to the ocean floor, a piece of cork, so you can find it, it still belongs to you. If someone else finds yeah. it and lifts it, they may be entitled to- And, and indeed, if you, if you were counsel for Young Brothers, you would say, don't abandon this. It's oh, not in your interest legally to abandon it. It's all the worst things if you were We're gonna fight it. tooth and nail to make sure that these shippers don't get a penny more than they're entitled to. They're okay, let's, let's get to policy, Jay. We gotta get to policy. So what have we learned here? What have we learned by this remarkable event, which hasn't happened in Hawaii that I know of before, um, but which involves a, a, a large loss at a time when um, you know, we're, we're faced with other losses and Young Brothers is faced with other losses at a time when the supply chain is very important. And God knows what was in those, we don't really know what's in those containers yet. And, and maybe there'll be, uh, you know, that'll be part of the investigation either by the, the Coast Guard or the uh, National Transportation Safety Board. Um, but what have we learned? What have we learned about inter-island shipping? Uh, what have we learned about the way we do business in, in creating a, a reliable supply line um, and in establishing appropriate you know, boundaries or maybe not so much boundaries uh, to shippers uh, for the value of goods. Um, Going back a month ago, Young Brothers sought to decrease the number of voyages that they were mandated on their agreement with the state to do. They went, I think, from two voyages a week to one voyage a week. So what happens is they've got more goods and they take more risks. Uh, James Mercanti was talking about the stowage plan. Well, apparently they were stacking these goods on the stern of the vessel uh, in a way that wasn't normally done. And I have a lot of clients who work for this company. And the scuttlebutt is that the lashing was a problem. And that was, you know, but I don't know that and they'll look and find it out. But if they were taking greater risks because they're having less voyages, then that's a public policy matter that we need to look into. Those workers want to be working more. And they're not being given the opportunity to do that by Young Brothers, which mm. is really Salt Check, which mm. is a company in, in Washington. So you would ask the Public Utilities Commission to look into this and maybe um, make some standards for lashing, uh, make, make some standards for the whole stowage plan uh, to satisfy the concerns that arise. Um, you know, the other, the other thing, James, uh, is that Admiralty, Admiralty, as Jay said, goes back to Roman days. Admiralty is really old and maybe in some ways too old. Uh, Admiralty is a whole body of law that's based, uh, you know, uh, the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries um, when the oceans opened up to international trade, really. Um, does Admiralty need to be changed here? Some of the rules you've articulated, um, I wonder if they're current. I wonder if some international body ought to take a look at this and um, an update Admiralty to, to shipping as it exists, as it is conducted today. What do you think? Uh, I think well, I, yeah, I think that while the statutes that are being relied on here, the, Car the Harder Act, the Carriage of Goods by Sea Act are well over hundred years old. Uh, they, they, they have been you know, prop properly main maintained and, and, and do govern well. Uh, carry, you know, I would think that the, the $500 per package is outdated, and I'm sure that uh, Young Brothers knows that, and that's why, I guess, out of the goodness of their own bill of lading, they've increased it unilaterally to $5,000. But, um, you know, they do govern, and, and they, are, they are actually, these statutes are, you know, protective of the shippers. Uh, they're, not, they're not as protective of the carriers as they are of the shippers. They, you know, these statutes were enacted to allow shippers uh, to recover against ocean, against ocean carriers because there's an unfair bargaining power. You know, when you're dealing with a, an ocean carrier like Matson Lines and Young Brothers, you know, there's an unequal bargaining power. So these statutes are really designed to help, you know, the, the Jays and the Jameses of the world to, to, to e e even the playing field. Uh, you know, but obviously some of the limitations of liability are outdated. 
Um, but I, I don't think that there's going to be any big cry to change maritime law uh, because at the end of the day, uh, you know, everyone knows what was in those containers, or at least the NTSB and the Coast Guard, and it will be discovered what happened. And if this, if this was a complete breakdown of due diligence on behalf of Young Brothers, and we don't know that. It may have been weather related. It may have been, here's a very important point. This may be shipper related. I mean, if I'm a shipper and I give Young Brothers my container and this happens and I say, this container weighs uh, 1400 pounds and it's my mistake, it weighs 14,000 pounds and, and I misdeclare it. You know, that's a shipper problem and Young Brothers wouldn't be responsible for that. So well, I'm, I'm just a member of the public on this, James. I, I don't know what equipment they have, but it seems to me that I wouldn't rely on a declaration of the shipper. I would have a scale. Scale is easy. You, you're rolling it on anyway, drop it on the scale for a minute and you can tell exactly what it weighs, right? And that's what they, that's right. And that's what they should do. And, and but, but, we, but we don't know if they have, if, if when they lift these containers, some, you know, because they have these, uh, uh, container cranes that lift these and place them on the barge and some of the new container cranes you know have the, what the, the scales built into it so that we don't know but there have been cases where there's a misdescription of cargo a misdeclaration of cargo where uh, so that, that that needs to be determined whether this is truly a young brother's problem here and look we don't know who supplied the lashings they may buy the lashings. Sure, and, sure. And, 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 well, and, and then maybe there's going to be findings. Continue. There's going to be findings from the NTSB. There's going to be findings from the Coast Guard. And I'm sure they'll be made public. They'll be available to us. I know uh, Jay will be able to see them very quickly. And I hope we can get together again, the three of us, and uh, examine you know, what comes out of this. But I want to ask Jay one last question. Jay, do you think that this ultimately will result in a change in the number of carriers that serve the inter-island trade in Hawaii? And should it? Well, it definitely should. Will it? It's a battle between Walter Dodds, who's running Matson, and uh, Salchik's people over in Washington State. They divvied up our little game here, and they're getting to decide what the real deal is in terms of what it costs you to move things inter-island. It definitely should. Are we going to get it? It's very difficult because of the Jones Act, which requires the coastwise trade to be done by American bottoms. We can't have a Korean company come in here and start moving these things. It has to be done under the Jones Act, which requires American crew, American ownership, American American. It's very important. All right, that's another show. Well, we've we've actually proliferated the issue to a number of shows. Yes, James. Yeah, I, I just, uh, because your listeners may be interested in that very good question you asked, Jay, about finders and keepers, I wrote an article uh, my, on my firm's website in J July 25th, 2016, on that very topic, because I write the uh, column for the New York Law Journal, the Admiralty Law Column, and the title is Treasure at Sea, Finders Are Not Always Keepers. <laughs> and so that, and that will be what we leave with our listeners today. <laughs> Finders are not always keepers. There are many, many legal issues in this case. And in fact, still factual issues. And I, I hope we can revisit with you guys after we know more. James Mercanti, an Admiralty Lawyer in New York. Uh, Jay Friedheim, Admiralty Lawyer here in Honolulu. Thank you both uh, so much. We greatly appreciate your appearance. Aloha. Aloha.